I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. What a comforting word that must have been to the Israelites, especially for those who knew with every fiber of their being that they were in their current mess. And a big mess it really was because of their sin. It was a wonderful word of hope to them. And this word came from kind of a surprising source, Jeremiah. By this point in the prophet's career, probably 40 plus years by now, he was very well known. And he was not famous for bringing words of comfort and hope to the people. If anything, he was seen as sort of a curmudgeon who was a constant gadfly to both the religious and the political establishment. Over a period of years, Jeremiah tried to persuade a succession of kings that God wanted obedience and not political solutions to all of Judah's problems. His warnings, however, fell constantly on deaf ears. During his time as a prophet in Jerusalem, he had attacked the nation's religious hypocrisy, which was used more like a good luck charm. As long as we go through the motions of worshiping, all will be well with God. It seemed to be the attitude by everyone during that time period, not just the religious and political leaders, but everyone in Israel. He saw injustice rampant with the oppression of those who were less fortunate. He foretold the coming of the forces of Babylon and re recommended national surrender. He was hated by his family and friends. He was forbidden to preach in the temple. He was arrested and placed in stocks he was beaten and imprisoned. He was dropped down into a cistern that had nothing in it but gooey muck. Jeremiah's special prophetic anguish came from knowing that God's covenant with God's people was not what was wrong and why Jerusalem was in such deep problems. What was wrong, however, was the way God's people had tried or not tried to keep the covenant that they had made with God. This covenant had been written on stone tablets when they had been rescued out of slavery in Egypt. But Jeremiah had a vision while in prison as the city fell around him to the Babylonians. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. These are words of hope, quite different from all of the prophetic words he'd used in the past. Words of doom and destruction that they were used to hearing. At the time of these words by Jeremiah, Judah was already conquered and all but a small remnant had been carried off into exile, away from home, away from their land and family, and in the, in the, in the minds of some, they were also away from God, more or less as Jeremiah had predicted. They had broken every covenant that God had given them, and now we're experiencing captivity once again. A once proud nation now reduced to a life of slavery in a foreign land. Their history repeats over and over again. Now the prophet's words to them were concerned with how to get along in this new environment. In an open letter to the exiles, he suggested that they make the most of their situation. And in an earlier chapter, chapter 29, Jeremiah assures the exiled people, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in it, it's welfare, you will find your welfare. Now, Jeremiah went on to let them know that this would not be a short-term condition. They were looking at 70 years, time enough for an entire generation to be born and die. Yes, they were away from home. They were away from their land and family, but they were not away from God. And God had plans for them even still. God had plans for them a future with hope, in Jeremiah's words. In spite of all that they had done, God was still prepared for them to use them for God's own purpose. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them from the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make, that I will make with the house of Israel at, after these days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will put my law within them, not on stone tablets. I will write it instead on their hearts. It will not be an external set of rules, but an internal motivation written on the heart, a habit of the heart for the people. People do, will do what is right just because it is right. People will do what is right just because it is the right thing to do. Wow. That will be a dramatic change for the cycle that has been repeated so often. Those people received a covenant from God. They follow it briefly, fall away from it, and are punished. They return to the covenant with God, only re to repeat that cycle over and over again. So now the Lord says, the vision is for a new covenant which will be kept continually and naturally. One that is written upon your heart, one that is kept because it is now the habit of your heart within you to keep it. The old covenant is like a posted speed limit and I a traffic cop. We obey it because we are afraid of getting a ticket if we don't. The new covenant is driving at a speed based on respect for the conditions of the roadway, the residents of the neighborhood, that you care about the safety of the other drivers and ourselves and the children, as well as our own need to get from one place to another. If you think about it, the speed is the same, but the difference is in the motivation behind going the speed extrinsic versus intrinsic. Before it was a law that was written down for everyone to obey with consequences to bear if you didn't heed the law. An extrin extrinsic motivation. But now this new covenant with God says that it will be one that's written upon our heart. Our motivation is for the welfare and the well-being of all of God's creation for others as well as ourselves with a completely different set of consequences to bear if you don't heed this new law written on your heart. It's an intrinsic motivation. External, extrinsic, internal, intrinsic. Now, I would love to report that soon after Jeremiah's words were spread abroad among the exiles, that their fulfillment came, but we know that that's not the case. The exiles did, in fact, return, but the new covenant that God was to establish with the people did not come about the right way. In did not come about right away. In fact, by the time we actually hear of this new covenant, more than a 500 years had elapsed. And it came when Jesus sat with his disciples in an upper room. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. It wasn't until Christ came that God fulfilled that new covenant with his people. And according to today's gospel lesson from John, word had begun to get around about Jesus. It was a week before the passionate sacrifice of Christ was to take place. Crowds had already greeted his entry into Jerusalem. And in John's chrono chronology, this was fast on the heels of his raising Lazarus back to life after four days in the tomb. Jesus was beginning to attract significant crowds, and they were even bigger than normal because this was a festival week. And people had traveled from all over the known world to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. Word about Jesus had apparently spread to even visitors that were, had come to the city. Some of these Gentile converts, or God-fearers, as they were known, got wind of this incredible rabbi, and they wanted to meet him. So they came to the disciples and asked for an appointment. We never hear whether or not they got their audience. We assume they did. But instead, what is written about the scenario is kind of rather bizarre. Jesus tells Andrew and Philip in front of the crowds that had gathered that day, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay. A certain tingle of excitement must have raced through those who heard that. 
This was exactly what a lot of people had been waiting for three years to hear. Now, Jesus would throw off the Judean Clark Kent disguise and become Israel's Superman, the war hero that they'd been waiting for. They were hoping to overthrow Rome and bring Israel back to its former glory as a nation and one that would be even greater in the future. Yes, glory had come to Israel. But wait, that's not exactly what happens, is it? What follows in the Gospel account is almost a stream of consciousness as a monologue, which we who live on this side of the crucifixion and the resurrection can understand, but it must have left his original hearers completely confused. So for a moment, put yourself in their place. There was that statement about the grain of wheat having to die in the ground before it can bear fruit. What has that got to do with the conquering Messiah? That, but that was immediately followed with those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And then he says, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Finally, he takes a deep breath and sighs. Now my, troll is, my soul is troubled. And those who are standing there listening probably whispered, <laughs> ours is too. You're not making any sense. This isn't what we expected. Suddenly, Jesus lifts his eyes upward and begins a conversation with heaven that is punctuated with what some hear as a clap of thunder, others insist it's the voice of an angel. But one way or another, it is most disquieting for the crowd. And finally, he says, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Yes, you and I know what he was talking about, but you can be sure that those who first heard him were confused. Notice something, though. Confused or not, they stayed. There was something about Jesus that did indeed draw people to him. It had been so since the night of his birth when humble shepherds and the learned magi had come to Christ. As a boy in the temple, there were rabbis and scholars who gathered around him. As a man, there were people from all walks of life, from fishermen and tax collectors to men like Nic Nicodemus that we read about last week, the cream of Israelite society. There were upstanding women and fallen women, the little children that loved him enough to make such a nuisance of themselves that the disciples had to try to stop and shoo them away. Even a hard-bitten Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, would be mesmerized enough by him to disavow any blame for his execution. So why were people so attracted to Jesus? Scripture says that he was not particularly handsome. He came from no family of influence. He had no money. Was it the miracles? Perhaps. There are always some who want to see a magic show. But on a deeper level, what Jesus must have embodied for people and their sense of hope was a sense of hope. The same kind of hope that ancient Judah felt when they heard those words from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. In other words, you can take this to the bank, a new covenant. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. This one will be automatic. No way for us to blow it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, which is hope. The words of Jeremiah brought hope to the people of Jerusalem, exiled in Babylon. The words of Jesus brought hope to the people of his day, exiled inside themselves for a better future. If we read the newspaper, we might feel we are living in a world devoid of hope. We wonder how anyone survives in this life. We survive by the measure of our hope. The exiles in Babylon found their hope in the gracious words of Jeremiah and his description of the handwriting on their heart. In exile, they built homes, they planted gardens, they had children, and one day they actually did return, intact and strong. But it wasn't until that new covenant that was established by Christ that it became written upon their hearts. What is written upon their hearts now is hope. Every day, it becomes a habit of the heart to hope for a brighter tomorrow. Because no matter what today brings, 
we have Christ in our hearts and in our lives. And in this season of the pandemic and all that's occurred, hope is the one thing that will bring us back together again with Christ in our hearts and an intrinsic motivation for the future. Thanks be to God. Amen.